Welcome to Lab 8. So this week we will be discussing paired data analysis. So again, my name is Reed um, Shoymilik. I am one of the GSIs for this course who is handling the pre-recorded videos. Um, so a little bit more about how these labs are going to start running. Um, so we have our um, new weekly schedule and responsibilities for this course now given that we're running online. Um, so in terms of the schedule, um, now starting on Fridays um, will be when we start releasing lecture recordings by 8 a.m. as well as these pre-recorded live videos will also be uploaded by 8 a.m. on Fridays as well. Um, so these videos will be available by these times for you to watch. Um, and then what you guys will need to work on. Um, so Mondays we will still have our pre-labs due um, on by, or via Canvas assignments. So those will still be due Monday by 8 a.m. And then Tuesdays or Wednesdays is when we'll, um, those days will be when we'll, we'll be hosting live stream virtual labs held via Blue Jeans. So those will be lab instructors hosting live dreams, uh, live streams um, of the lab for you guys to work on the lab in real time. So if you are watching this pre-recorded video for the lab and you r run through it and you decide or you think that you have any questions on any of the material, you could always also attend one of these virtual labs and you can get your questions answered during then. So even if you do end up watching the pre-recorded video, you could still attend the virtual lab and get questions answered in that way. Um, so those will be Tuesdays and Wednesdays. And then in terms of other work that'll be due for you, um, so homeworks instead of Thursdays, they'll now end up being due on Fridays through coursework by 8 a.m. as well as um, the lab ticket. So actually, instead of working on that particular lab ticket and handing it in like we used to, the way that we'll be doing that now is after you work on the lab ticket and the ILP and the review by example, everything that's about the lab. Um, once you work through all of that, um, there'll be um, a Canvas quiz posted sometime during the week. And then what you'll need to do is um, work through that. The Canvas quiz should be like a myriad of questions going through each. Um, so you might see some questions from the ticket from the ILP or from the review by example. Um, so you'll need to work through those questions on the Canvas quiz, and then that'll be how you get your attendance score for the labs each week from now on. So as you notice, um, in terms of you can complete the lab, you can either do method A, which is watching this pre-recorded video, or you can go to the virtual lab, the live stream, Tuesdays or Wednesdays. Um, okay. Uh, so also note that this week we're still doing MWrite, um, so the prompt for number two is still running in addition to this week's um, tasks. All right. So going back more specifically to this week, our reminders. Um, so again, we need to look at for our Lab 8, that Canvas quiz that will be due the, this Friday, the 20th by 8 a.m. Um, homework 7, that will be due on Friday by 8 a.m. as well. Um, your MWrite, your, um, since you had your initial submission due last week, you should have your peer review for your second prompt due by this Friday by 5 p.m. And then your next pre-lab will be due Monday the 23rd by 8 a.m. Um, and there is a couple resources that I think would be helpful for you guys to look at in terms of studying this material for um, homeworks and exams. Um, so one neat tool that you guys can look out is to try out the Name That Scenario tool. It's linked on Canvas. Um, it's also li linked on eCoach. Um, so this would be helpful in finding, um, looking at these differences between mean of differences and differences in two means. So this week we're discussing that mean of differences in paired data, and then next week we'll be, be discussing more about two independent means, which is what the difference in two means means. <laughs> um, so the name that scenario tool will be, will be really helpful in differentiating what these problems are and how they look. Um, and it will also be helpful to, for you guys to start to fill in worksheets one and two. So what these are 
um, they are in the lab workbook. Um, so before the labs actually start, you see these things called worksheets and supplements. Um, so worksheets one and two will be really helpful for you guys to work on. Those on page, they are on pages five and six, as well as pages 11 and 12. So let's get started with a little bit of review. Um, so this week we're concerning ourselves with population mean of differences. So in general, what we'd say data is collected in pairs and we now desire information about the differences between the two. Um, so this week, we're, it's basically the, the exact same thing as we were talking about last week with one population mean, except now we're specifically analyzing a population of differences instead of a population of observations. So let's say, for example, we have we were looking at two different populations and we gather two different samples. Um, and what we're doing is pairing any particular observation from that sample and finding the differences between those two specific observations that we paired. And then we'll get a new observation of the difference between those two. And then what we're doing is basically creating a new sample of differences and then concerning ourselves just with that one particular sample that came from a pop that one population of differences. So other than the fact that we're I'm specifically looking at a population of differences. It's the exact same thing as what we talked about last week. So there are a few ways that data could be matched or paired. Um, a couple ways that we discussed. Um, the first way could be from the same individual. So we have each person in a or unit is measured twice. Um, so say, for example, if we were talking about like a certain drug study, that um, a patient was given a certain drug and we were wanting to measure a response before and after that given that particular drug. And we were interested in the difference of the reaction um, from before and the after of the treatment. Um, so that's one way data can be paired. Um, another way could be matched individuals. So say we have two individuals that are pretty similar to one another, so we're gonna go ahead and match those two um, and, and look at the, the difference between those particular two individuals. Um, so say each member of this pair will receive a different treatment and that same response is measured between them. Um, so we'll look at a couple examples of what either of these are, but the bottom line, um, can an observation from one group be matched or paired with a particular observation from another group in any reasonable or meaningful way? That's the big picture that we're looking for. Um, so some examples of how data pair data can look like in for same individuals. So the first example, we have a company developed a new drug that is intended to lower a pa patient's cholesterol. We can measure the cholesterol of all patients both before and after the drug is given and then examine the differences. Um, so in this case, again, um, we're looking at each particular patient um, is given this cholesterol drug, and we want to have um, this cholesterol reading both before they take this drug and after, and then what we're interested in is the difference of the reading between those two observations. So specifically that one observation of the difference. Um, and then we can look at the second example. So we have McKinsey believes that college students can run a faster mile in the afternoon versus the morning. She has 10 friends run a mile in the morning and then on another day has the same friends run a mile in the afternoon. Then these times are recorded and the differences in mile times are analyzed. Um, so again, similar situation, Mackenzie has her 10 friends. Um, they run a mile once in the morning and then they run a mile again in the afternoon. So each particular friend has two measurements. One is a mile in the morning, one is a mile time in the afternoon and she's interested specifically in the difference of those times. All right, so let's take a look at a couple examples of how paired data looks between matched individuals. So the first example we have, um, we ask couples to individually report how many hours of sleep they get per night. The difference for each pair is computed and these differences are analyzed. Um, so we're matching these um, individuals by them being a couple, them sleeping on the same bed, 
um, and then we're looking at the differences of the hours of sleep they get per night. Um, so the one within these couples, one one has one, however, um, however amount of sleep they get, and then the other person has however amount of sleep that they get. But what we're interested in is rather than those two separately, what we want to see is specifically the difference between those two. Um, Okay, and then looking at the second example, um, so a physical trainer wants to examine the effects of a new workout routine on weight loss. They match up clients based on similar lifestyles and physical traits and put one group of clients through the new routine and the other group through the old routine. The difference in weight loss is calculated for each predetermined pair and these differences are analyzed. So again, we're matching these two individuals on that they have the similar lifestyle, same physical traits, but then we're given um, these people a different routine, a different um, fitness routine, and we want to see if there are um, much differences in how much weight they lose, um, specifically between those two. All right. Um, so in the case that data is not paired in specific their specific observations, um, we could also be looking at two independent samples. Um, we'll learn more about this next week when we discuss two independent means type testing. But just so you guys know what this might look like, we can go over it a little bit. So again, when data is not paired, we can analyze just in general two populations and their averages. Um, and so here we would say the two populations we sample from are independent from one another. So a couple examples of what these might look like. So comparing SAT scores for in-state versus out-of-state students. Um, so in here we have our two groups, in-state versus out-of-state, but you see here that there's um, no any particular way that we're pairing a specific in-state student to any specific out-of-state student and seeing the differences between those two particular observations. So in this case, what we're instead interested in is just as a whole, the difference in the in-state students' SAT scores versus the out-of-state students, their averages, the differences between their averages. Um, the second example, similarly, um, so we're comparing heights of Michigan residents versus Indiana. Um, so again, we're not um, matching any particular Michigander to a particular Indiana resident. Um, we're just seeing the average heights of Michiganders versus the average heights of Indiana residents and seeing the differences of those averages. So instead of any particular observations, just more in general of the whole group. All right, so we can um, look at a couple questions. So that's what, whenever you see these slides called Think About It, um, that'll be a certain question that we can go over. So whenever we get to these, if you ever wanna pause the video, kind of think about the question yourself before I go over the solutions to them, you can. Um, okay, so let's look at this first question. You interview 200 university students in their freshman year and again in their senior year and each time ask for the student to report the number of hours they spend exercising weekly. So would you think this is an example of paired data or two independent samples? Right, so in this case, this would be an example of paired data. Um, so you see here that um, each particular student has two measurements. One, um, so they're both um, for their hours they spend exercising weekly. So they get measured once their freshman year and once their senior year and we wanna see like the difference between those measurements between their freshman and senior year. So you see here that we're actually pairing these observations by student. One student has their two different measurements. All right, so let's take a look at another question. We have, you interview a random sample of 200 in-state students and another random sample of 200 out-of-state students and ask each about the average number of minutes per day that they spend using social media. Do you think this is an example of paired data or two independent samples? All right, so this would be an example of two independent samples. As you see here, we have our two different samples of in-state and out-of-state students, but in this particular case, um, there's not actually any way that any observation from one group is being matched with any observation from another group. No in-state student is particularly paired with another out-of-state student. In this case, we're um, just kind of more in general looking at the differences between the groups as a whole. So because there's nothing reasonably, reasonably pairing these students, we'd say that they're just independent from one another. All right, so let's look, 
take a look at this one last question. Red Bull sales fluctuate from week to week. A study is conducted to compare the sales of Red Bull energy drinks at a convenience store versus at a grocery store. For each store, the number of cans sold each week will be recorded for the next 10 weeks. So would you think this is a, an example of paired data or two independent samples? All right, so this one was a little bit trickier, um, but um, as you see here, we're looking at Red Bull sales um, at a grocery store versus a convenience store. Um, but in this case, we would actually be having these two different measurements happening each week. So in this case, we'd actually would be pairing the data by each week. So grocery store sales versus convenience store sales by the week, looking at the differences. So let's go ahead and take a look at the review by example. Um, so this will be on page 63 of your lab workbook. We'll go ahead and take a look at the prompt. Um, so we have Major League Baseball would like to assess if batting averages are different during nighttime games and daytime games on average at a 5% significance level for the population of MLB batters. A sample of 58 batters is selected at random. Both the nighttime and daytime batting averages are collected for each of the 58 batters. Let mu sub d represent the population mean difference in batting average, specifically nighttime minus daytime, for all batters in the MLB. So this is a different type of hypothesis test, but it is still a hypothesis test, so we have our certain steps we need to follow. The first one is determining our null and alternative hypotheses. Next, we will state and check our assumptions for the test. Afterwards, we will um, calculate the test statistic and determine our p-value. And then once we have that p-value, we can move on to our fourth and final step, where we make decisions and draw conclusions. Um, so for our first step, we can um, state the hypotheses the researcher would like to test. Um, so we have three possible options for our hypothesis statements. Um, so again, this might look really similar to last week's one mean type testing. The only difference is looking at our certain parameter we're working with, since this is um, specifically looking at a population of differences. That means that our parameter would be would be us looking at a population mean of differences. So that's why we denote the mu as mu sub d. That's what that sub d means. It's the mean of differences. So usually the most common test value is zero. That means that there wouldn't be a difference between the two groups, but this could change depending on each problem. So that could be like our null hypothesis. We could set our mu sub d2 equals zero, saying that there's no difference um, versus our alternative hypothesis is what specifically we're trying to test for, if it's specifically greater than or less than zero or just simply unequal to. Um, so in this case, we would like to set our null hypothesis again that mu sub d equals zero, that there's no difference in these batting averages nighttime versus daytime. And the, but then our alternative hypothesis, what we're actually trying to test for, would be just in general that our mu sub d is unequal to zero, that there is um, some certain difference between the nighttime versus daytime batting averages. And we can also define our parameter, our mu sub d, we could say that that represents the population mean of differences in batting average, specifically nighttime less daytime for all batters in the MLB. So whenever we're working with our um, population of differences, it's always good to specify um, what group is being subtracted from which. So in this particular case, it was defined that we're looking specifically at nighttime less daytime, so it's always good when we're adding that context in to be specific about the difference, um, how we actually created that difference. So in this case, we're subtracting the daytime from the nighttime averages, so nighttime less daytime. All right. Um, so we could also look at why this is a paired t-test specifically. Um, so we could see that each of our batters have two different measurements. So each of our batters um, has their nighttime batting average as well as their daytime batting average. So um, each of these observations are being paired by the player. So that's why this is a particularly a paired t-test. 
All right, so that was our first step of our hypothesis test. We can go ahead and look at the second step. So we want to state the necessary assumption and, again, think about how to check them. So if we think about what we did last week for our one mean type testing, we can look at those two assumptions that our data are a random sample and our data are observations from a normally distributed population. So for this week, as I said, um, since our um, mean of difference, uh, mean of differences type testing is really similar to this one mean testing. So we might assume that our assumptions are really similar, which they indeed are. So for paired data, the assumptions are almost exactly the same. We just need to specify that we're looking at um, our sample or population of differences. So for our first assumption, we have that data are a random sample of differences. And our second assumption, data are observations from a normally distributed population of differences. So assumptions are really similar, just specifying that we're looking at difference data. Um, now I can just go ahead and think about how I would check for these assumptions. Um, so for our first assumption, data are a random sample of differences. Um, usually this is just given in the problem. You don't really need to worry about testing for this yourself. It's usually the second ass assumption about normality is the one that we really need to test for. So again, data are observations from a normally distributed population of differences. So again, remembering how we check for the normality, we usually either graph a QQ plot or histogram. Um, but remember in this case, since we're looking at um, our difference data, we would want to graph either of these for our sample of differences to see if we can assume that the sample of differences is from a normally distributed population of differences. So if you think I'm ramming it in the head, hopefully I'm ramming it in your guys' head that this is um, specifically, we need to specify that we're looking at difference data whenever we're defining our assumptions and our interpretation. Right. And again, looking back, um, if we were to check for normality and we were to see that our original population might not follow that normal assumption, um, we could also check to see if we have that large enough sample size. And then in which case we can also, if that is the case, then we can assume that our sample mean differences denoted with our D bar. So our sample mean differences um, are normally distributed by that central limit theorem. So again, we can use the central limit theorem in this case. We just need to specify, again, th that whenever we create that new distribution, um, in this case, we're creating a distribution of sample mean differences. All right. So another think about it for you guys. Um, so we will need to assume that the population mean of differences in batting averages, again, specifically nighttime minus daytime, we want to say that this is normally distributed. Do you guys think this is a true or a false statement? All right, so this one was probably a little tricky. Um, so if we're looking at this, um, actually um, reading again the problem, so um, assuming the population mean of differences. So if we're looking at that keyword, um, so the population mean of differences, so that is just a single fixed value. That's just our one mean, right? So we don't, any, so we don't associate any distribution with just one number. So that would be what would make this a false statement. So we wouldn't want to say that our population mean of differences is normally distributed. Instead, we'd want to say something like um, that the population of differences is normally distributed. So just a quick note for you guys whenever you're looking at problems like this, just know that the mean is just one number. The mean doesn't have any distribution to it. What we want to see is the, the full population of differences needs to be normally distributed. All right. Um, so we can take a look at our third step for our test. Um, so actually, we already have our test statistic and p-value calculated for us. That's nice. Um, so for this particular question, we have the resulting t-test statistic value is 2.812, and the corresponding p-value for this pair of t-tests is 0 0.0067. 
So the first thing we want to do is provide an interpretation of the test statistic. Um, so for this, we can go ahead and take a look at what this interpretation might look like. Um, so um, our interpretation of the test statistic, we could say our observed sample mean difference, D, um, which is denoted with our D bar, is 2.812 standard errors above the hypothesized population mean difference in batting average night minus day for all batters in the MLB. All right. So in general, usually we say with our interpretation of the test statistic, usually what that's saying is trying to measure the difference from our particular sample to our hypothesized um, population. So in this case, since we're looking at our difference data, we can look at that sample mean difference and its distance away from that population difference, um, population mean difference, and this um, distance between the two will be standardized by um, however many standard errors they are in the distribution. So that's basically, if you notice the formula that's also given, that's basically what the interpretation is basically explaining in words what this formula is doing. And also again, notice that um, whenever we specify in the interpretation, since this is a positive test statistic, we'll specify that we are 2.812 standard errors above the population mean difference. So another thing about it for you guys, what is the distribution of the test statistic if the null hypothesis is true? Um, so for that, um, whenever you see questions like that about um, if the null hypothesis is true, um, what um, distribution we follow, that's just saying like our t-test statistic, um, we have to follow that t-distribution. So if you um, look at this um, sketch that we have for our p-value, first you'll notice um, our label for the t-distribution. So this will be that distribution that we find our test statistic with, or that we find our p-value with, I mean. And then also with our um, distribution um, label, we have to have our certain parameters. Um, so with our t-distribution, we're looking at that one parameter of degrees of freedom, which in this case is 57. All right, so actually um, looking closer at this distribution for this sketch of the p-value. Um, so we could plot our test statistics. So remember, in this case, um, we we're looking at just in general that um, for our alternative hypothesis, we're not specifically looking at less than or greater than, but more in general unequal to. So that would make this a two-tailed type test. So what that means is that whenever we plot the p-value, we plot it on either side of our distribution. So we would plot our test statistic, both the positive and the negative values of it, and then we'll shade um, to as or more extreme of either test statistic. So to the right of the positive 2.812, and also to the left of the negative 2.812. And both of these values together should get us a, our full p-value of 0 0.0067. So looking back at our p-value interpretation, if you remember from last week, we were discussing that interpretation. Um, so remember, in general, um, assuming the null hypothesis is true, the probability of getting a test statistic as or more extreme than the observed value of the test statistic. So this is, in general, what the p-value is saying. Um, so just remember this. Whenever um, we start working on the ILP, um, we'll be asked to write out in context a p-value interpretation. So just note these certain topics for the interpretation. It'll be helpful for the lab. So make sure that we're stating that the null hypothesis is true, stating that in context. We also want to state the direction of the alternative within the interpretation. So if it's specifically less than, greater than, or just simply unequal to, and then also that context. All right, so um, before we do that, though, we need to finish off the review by example so we can look at that fourth and final step of our hypothesis test, so providing a well-written decision and conclusion in context of the problem. All right. So remember, in making our decisions, um, we have to compare that p-value to our significance level, 
So in this case, our significance level is 5%, 0.05. We're given our p-value of 0 0.0067. Um, so that means um, since our p-value is less than, um, we can make the decision to reject our null hypothesis. And then once we make that decision to reject the null, um, we can write our conclusion um, more in basis of that alternative. Um, so we could write something such as there is sufficient evidence to suggest, and then after this is where we start getting into more in context what that alternative hypothesis was saying. So there is sufficient evidence to suggest that the population mean of differences in batting average, specifically nighttime minus daytime, is not equal to zero for all batters in the MLB. All right. All right, so that's about it for the review by example. So we can go ahead and get started with the ILP. Um, so for this ILP, um, we are asking the question, um, do books purchased at Barnes & Noble cost more than if purchased at Amazon.com on average? Um, so we'll be working with a specific data set. Um, it should explain how to load it up in R Commander within the ILP. Um, just, just remember that um, the data can be found in Canvas. Um, so if you go to Files on the left-hand side of the Canvas homepage, you'll see for Files. And then there'll be a folder named data sets. This will be any data we work with in the class. You can find it in there. So make sure to pause this video and take about 20 to 25 minutes or however long you need since this is a pre-recorded video, honestly. Um, so just take however long you need to work on the ILP. And then afterwards, we'll go over a little bit of the harder questions um, together. All right, so at this point, hopefully you guys have finished the ILP. So we'll be going over um, just a couple of solutions of some of the harder problems towards the end. So make sure just for the sake of your learning that you kind of look through those on your own before going to look at these solutions. But we'll go ahead and look at those right now. So we'll start off with the question asking about the interpretation of our p-value. Um, so, in terms of this interpretation, you could write it out a little bit too basic. Um, in this case, you probably wouldn't receive full credit for an interpretation that looks something like this. So, saying, assuming the null hypothesis is true, the probability of, of observing a test statistic of negative 1.1036 or more extreme is about 86%. So, this is just very basic. It doesn't really have the context of the problem too much. So we, we don't really know what this is actually talking about. Um, so how it should be um, written, we need to make sure that we're adding that context. So like assuming the null is true, what does that mean in our sense? So in this case, um, what that means is assuming the population mean difference in book prices, um, specifically Barnes & Noble less Amazon, is zero for the population of all such books. So that's our null hypothesis that we need to write out in context. So assuming this, uh, the probability of observing a t-test statistic of negative 1.1036 or greater is 86.17%. Um, so again, we should also be more specific about our direction of our alternative hypothesis. In this case, we're specifically looking at if the difference was greater than, so we should write that in our interpretation. Um, we can also look at the last question about forming our conclusion for this type of test. So in doing so, um, I'm going to um, show you a few different conclusions, and I want to see if you think that these certain statements are appropriate or not. So would you think this would be an, an appropriate conclusion? There is insufficient evidence to prove that the population mean of differences in book prices Barnes & Noble less Amazon is greater than zero for the population of all such books. So think about it. Do you think this is appropriate or not? Um, so in this case, um, it's almost there. Um, so it wouldn't be appropriate. And the reason is that this conclusion is a little too strong. So saying like um, insufficient evidence to prove, um, we should avoid words like prove or demonstrate. So remember, Whenever we're working with statistics, we're never really sure of anything. So whenever we form our conclusions, we want to um, 
talk about this evidence and we want to use words more like um, suggest or conclude instead of like prove or demonstrate are just a little too strong of words to use in our conclusions. Okay. Um, so let's take a look at this conclusion. So there is insufficient evidence to suggest that books purchased at Barnes & Noble are more expensive than books purchased on Amazon.com. Would you think this is appropriate or not? So again, this one wouldn't be appropriate. This one's um, even closer than the last one, but it's still a little too strong. So if you notice within this interpretation, um, it's not um, saying anything about averages. So remember, um, whenever we're working through this hypothesis test, this is um, a population mean of differences type test. So we need to specify that certain parameter is what we're testing for in our conclusion. So we're not so not we're not seeing um, that in general books from Barnes and Noble are um, more expensive than those purchased on Amazon.com, but we're saying on average we think that books purchased on Barnes and Noble are more expensive than Amazon. So we need to specify that that average is what we're actually testing for in this hypothesis. So just a slight change would make this a right conclusion. So let's take a look at another conclusion. There is sufficient evidence to suggest that the population mean of differences in book prices, specifically Barnes & Noble less Amazon, is equal to zero for the population of all such books. Do you think this is appropriate or not? So again, this one wouldn't be an appropriate statement. So if you look closely, um, this conclusion is actually written about the null hypothesis. So it's saying like sufficient evidence that it does equal zero. Um, but whenever we write out our conclusions, we always want to write them out in terms of the alternative hypothesis. So we wouldn't want to say um, this. We want to uh, more write about that alternative hypothesis. In this case, it was um, that our population mean of differences is greater than zero and see if that's the case or not. Now let's take a look at this conclusion. So there is sufficient evidence to suggest that the population mean of differences in book prices, Barnes & Noble less Amazon, is greater than zero for the population of all such books. So finally, we get ourselves a, um, a perfect conclusion. So there's insufficient evidence to suggest, pop, um, so that would be our keyword that's not too strong, that the population mean of differences, so that's our certain parameter we're testing for, that's good. So, and we're also seeing that um, book prices, Barnes Noble less Amazon, is greater than zero, so we know this is about the alternative hypothesis for the population of all such books. So this conclusion looks great, it's completely appropriate for us. All right, so that's a little bit um, about our conclusion. So. Just in general, remembering how we form our decisions and conclusions. Remember, our decisions are always made about the null hypothesis. So that's just um, when we say if we reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. Um, so that's our decision. Um, and then after we make our decision, we can write out our conclusion. And those conclusions are always based on the alternative hypothesis. So that's where we write we have sufficient or insufficient evidence to suggest. And then after we write out that, then we would write out the alternative hypothesis in context of the problem and at about that whatever certain parameter we're working with. In this case, this parameter is that population mean of differences. So before we end the lab for this week, I want to again discuss a certain term of the week with you guys. Um, this week we'll be talking about the test statistic interpretation. So this will be a continuation from last week's um, p-value example. So it'll be the same type of problem, just looking at a different type of interpretation, specifically the test statistic. Um, so just at first looking at the generic interpretation of the test statistic. So we can say just in many cases, the test statistic is a standardized statistic that measures the distance between our certain sample value and the null value in terms of standard error units. So basically what that means is that we're seeing our certain sample that we've accrued and we want to see 
um, the distance between that and our um, hypothesized null value. And then, as you see within this formula, um, once we see that distance by doing one minus the other, we also divide by the null standard error. That's basically putting the distance between our sample and our null value more in context to our certain distribution we're looking at. So it's basically telling us how far away those two values actually are from one another. So that's what the test statistic is in general. Um, so looking back at the example that we talked about last time, so um, where we had your friend say that he can make 80% of his free throws, um, so we can look at those hypotheses again, that null value, or that null hypothesis that he does in fact make 80% of his free throws, so our proportion p equals 0.8 versus our alternative. Um, we are sure if he actually does, we think he makes less, so that's so we set our p to be less than 0.8 in our alternative. So um, again, your friend will shoot 100 free throws, and you will record what proportion they actually make. And again, assuming a random sample. Um, so from our given information, we have our hypothesized parameter, and we can also calculate our null standard deviation. So we can get these values into actually creating the test statistic. Um, so we have our um, null value, our hypothesized proportion of 0.8, our null standard deviation, again, using our formula for that standard deviation to find it to be 0 0.04. And then let's say in this particular example, again, your friend makes 74 of the free throws out of the 100. So that'll give us our certain sample proportion to be 0.74. So now that we have our certain sample proportion, we want to see how far away that sample actually is from our null value. So we could simply just look at the sample and the null value, its distance, just by doing one minus the other. And we can see that distance, 0.74 minus 0.8, we can see that that's a distance of 0 0.06. Um, but um, so we, what we want to know more is um, how to standardize this distance. So we want to see how far away these values actually are from one another um, in context to our certain distribution we're working with. So that's why we have to um, take that null standard deviation into account that tells us how far away those values actually are from one another. Um, so we will use that as our quote unquote measuring stick. Um, so let's take a look at what that might look like in our distribution. So seeing um, within our sampling distribution Again, we have our midpoint should be our, our expected value, our expected proportion of 0.8. And then we can see our sample proportion of 0.74, how far away that actually is given this distribution. You'd see if that's 1.5 measuring sticks away. Given our standard deviation of 0.04, our distance away from 0.06 puts us one and a half standard deviations away. So that's where our test statistic comes from. As we can see in this comparison between our sampling distribution, our possible p hat values, and our z test statistic, how they correspond to one another. All right, so that's exactly how we find our test statistic. And you can also see that within the formula to the z score. Um, so again, our p hat minus p naught. So we can see that distance 0.74 minus 0.8 and divided by our null standard deviation of 0 0.04 gets us that um, z-score of negative 1.5. So now that we have that test statistic, we can go ahead and try to interpret it. Um, so we can say something like our observed sample proportion is 1.5 null standard deviations below our hypothesized population proportion for all free throws your friend made. So this is in context of the problem, what how we would interpret this test statistic. Our sample is this distance away from our population. Um, so as you notice, in this case, we were talking about null standard deviation since we were discussing um, a one proportion type test. But um, depending on the type of test we're running, this certain um, quote unquote measuring stick might change. Um, so here's a nice table that kind of breaks down what these differences actually are. So concerning one population proportion, again, we're looking at null standard deviations. Two population proportions, we have null standard errors. 
And then for our mean type testing, so one mean, paired mean, and unpooled two population means, which we'll talk about in a diff uh, later lab, all these um, discuss standard errors as this measuring stick. All right. So that's it about the test statistics. So we can go ahead and take a look at um, one last time at our necessities for this interpretation. Again, we need our observed test statistic as well as our hypothesized parameter. And our test statistic is basically measuring that distance between these two values in terms of our standard errors deviations, depending on the type of test what we're looking at. And of course, we always need to make sure we're adding that context in. All right, so here's our lab ticket for you guys to take a look at and work on. Um, there should be a file within the virtual lab resources page as well that you could get a hold of in the actual um, document for the lab ticket to work on, but I also have it up here if you guys want to look at it. Um, so this lab ticket concerns itself again with paired data analysis. So the prompt we have, a study was conducted to examine the room utilization of two rooms at a sports facility during the lunch hour. The number of people in each room was counted at noon for 10 randomly selected days. So you see we have our certain data set. We have our room utilization for dance studio and weight room on these 10 different days. And then you also notice within the table that our last row concerns itself with just the differences between these amount of times. So remember for our paired data analysis, that's the main row that we'll be concerning ourselves with. Um, so a helpful hint for you guys, it looks like that this lab ticket actually follows along in terms of the process it takes. It's actually pretty similar to how we worked on the review by example. So if you take a look at, or take a look back at that review by example and the process that we took to work through that, um, that'll probably help out a lot when working on this lab ticket. All right, so that about wraps it up for this week's lab. Um, so don't forget that um, you guys need to complete the Canvas quiz to receive lab credit for this week. So the, how, the way the Canvas quiz works, um, so if you go to the left-hand side of the Canvas homepage, you'll, you should see a link for quizzes, and then it should be there. The way the Canvas quizzes are is that it kind of takes a few questions all from the review by example, from the ILP, and from the lab ticket. So make sure that we're working on all those things so um, the Canvas quiz could ask you questions from any of those. Um, so complete that and you'll get your lab credit. And that's about it. Thank you guys for watching.